it's uh, it's night th night three, hard to believe, but we're here uh, Sunday night. And thank you for joining uh, tonight, and thank you for joining Friday and Saturday night as well for all of you who have been able to. Tonight, uh, I'll be having a short conversation from a lady this time uh, by the name of Elaine Sayers. Uh, some of you will, will know Elaine. Uh, following this, John will speak on his final question. Is there any such thing as a new start? Don't forget, if you have any questions or you'd like to speak to John or I, or indeed any of the folks uh, that we've interviewed over the past uh, two nights, please do get in touch either through our Facebook page YouTube channel, uh, or even by email. Email address is godsmission20 at gmail.com. If you'd like a Bible, uh, then don't be shy and request one. We'd be only too happy to try and get one uh, delivered to you. So let's go uh, have a conversation with Elaine, and I, I trust you'll enjoy it. In fact, I, I, I know you will. So thank you. Hi, Elaine. It's uh, great to get chatting to you. And I know it's, it's maybe nicer to be chatting in person, and not over Zoom, but nevertheless, it's good to have Zoom and it's good to get the opportunity to talk to you, Elaine. Uh, and listen, I, I know God plays a big part in your life and that is great, uh, but I would just like you to maybe share with us, give us a wee bit of background uh, into who you are, where you're from, uh, and, and tell us how the Lord saved you and what the Lord has done for you in your life. Okay. Well, Johnny, thank you for asking me. Um, I'm probably better known as William Sayers, the singer's wife, and really not known as Elaine. Um, I like to be behind him, supporting him more so than uh, speaking. Um, well, William and I have been married now 15 years. Um, we have been together over 20 years, so I have been with him longer than I have been single. Um, we have three lovely daughters, 14, 11, and 9, and the girls all have made that commitment, and they mm -hmm. love the Lord. They have a lot to navigate through in life, and really, we want to just see them rooted in God's Word. So that's our prayer, and that's what we ask you to pray yeah. for, for us Amen. as well, as we do that. Um, having three girls, yes, is very busy. Um, I also work as a special needs teacher, which is a privilege. Um it's not really a job because I think if you do something like that, it really has to be a calling. And I've always believed yeah. that was my calling in life to work in special needs. Um, we live in the west of the province in a little village, Donamana, which I'm sure some people may have heard of. Um, and the town is Straban. So that's where my special needs school is that I work in. And yeah, nice area to live in. Beautiful area to live in during lockdown as well. Uh, being in the country has been such a blessing. Um, more so than I suppose living maybe in a city would be. So we're very thankful. Yeah, and uh, it is a lovely part of the world, uh, Elaine. And you're brought up in a Christian home, Elaine. So you've been taught, I suppose, the gospel from a young age. Uh, so I know you were saved young in life. Uh, so it's maybe important just to say, tell people what do you believe uh, and, and how you became a Christian. Well, Johnny, from a very young age, I knew that I needed to accept and put my trust in, in God. Um, I don't have the exact day, day or time, which really isn't very important because I know my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. And yeah. really, I have to um, just cling to the promises and just ensure that I have faithfulness and my obedience to, mm -hmm. to keep his commandments. I'm very thankful to have parents who, who love the Lord and who, who really helped me along the way. Um, but being in a Christian home, I suppose, in some way, you you take on so much from your parents and sometimes you can uh, take on their their faith and their beliefs, and which is all very good. But sometimes when people ask you questions, I would have been quoting what my dad said. And often I was quoting what Peter Fulton said. And I suppose then really I began to understand that I needed to really build my relationship with God and under. Uh, supposed to really understand what I believed and yeah. I knew that I believed in God but I had to really delve deeper into God's word and to really understand um, what God was telling me and what God wanted to share um, yeah. with me. So God God has played a big life in your in a uh, big part in your life Elaine from you've trusted him and, and fully committed to him. Uh, obviously over the last year 
Uh, there's a lot of people has had challenges and loads of different aspects of life. Uh, and none least, I'm sure, with yours, with you mentioned, you have three kids, and, and that's a challenge in itself. Uh, and you have work, you, you do have a challenging job, and it's great that you enjoy it, and you need to enjoy a job like that. But do, have you had challenges? Can you explain to me maybe some of the challenges I've had and, and how God has, has helped you through them? Challenges, Elaine, as your comforter or your helper? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a privilege to be a mother, um, but unfortunately it doesn't come with a manual. And um, my have a little bit of a weakness. And I suppose in some way it, it caused me to have to go off my work for about six months, a number of years ago. And really my problem and the challenge that I faced was this need for perfection all the time. And I think Johnny knows that because even trying to do this interview, uh, yeah. I was trying to get it uh, written down, which I suddenly realized you can't do. And that need for perf perfection really took my eyes off God. And it really, I would say I was, I was living life and I was doing quite well with things, but I was really doing it at my own strength. And that being on my own strength and then making that commitment of being baptized. Um, God really challenged me um, that I wasn't really fully relying on, on him. So that experience has really taught me a lot. So when it came to the challenge of lockdown, um, I would have felt I've learned a lot about myself and about my walk with mm -hmm. God and that really it is um, taking small steps and really refocusing and going back to God and realizing, well, what's God telling me in these situations? And initially lockdown for me was a lovely opportunity to push pause because life was fast. Um, in work, we were so busy and so much paperwork. It was that time of the year that you had a lot of paperwork in special needs school. So whenever we were told we were off, it was like, oh, I can catch my breath. So the start of lockdown for me was just lovely. Um, I was at home with my girls and homeschooling was very rosy at the start and, and it was lovely. And we were enjoying as, as, a, as a family, lovely quiet times together. And we were enjoying Colin, Colin Tinsley, his amazing ministry, which yeah. um, for our children was just such a blessing and for me as well. And um, so really initially what I experienced was just pure joy and, and really an opportunity just to get close with God again and to just really recalculate and see what we were doing. Um, but then the challenges because the reality hits in and I think the demands of your work because they really, they want everything done and um, they were learning as they went along, but I was having to record myself in front of videos and things, which was really out of my comfort zone, but the children needed it. Um, but then having to record and do family life at the same time and living in the west of the province where our Wi-Fi is just maybe not as good as the east. Yeah. Uh, it involved late nights of uploading work onto Google Classroom. Uh, so I love to watch that little loading line. And often it didn't load to one o'clock in the morning to ensure that it was ready for the children the next day. So tiredness then started kicking in. And then obviously when that tiredness kicks in, then things begin to drift a little. So the quiet times were, were drifting a little. So um, thankfully, I was able to, I had a husband who was able to keep us um, keep us focused as a family and ensure that we were walking with the Lord and we, we were able to stay online and go to church. But we also had our Bible study as well online, which really for us was a an amazing blessing. And we had our weekly midweek and really that ensured that any challenges that I had that I could share with other brothers and sisters and they could pray for me. So we had really a food bank going and that was able to support the children within our school um, through with our church and and that was really encouraging time for us and um, that uplifted me yeah, and we felt so that had a bit of purpose. Yeah so it's, it's presented uh, loads of opportunities in uh, in, in outreach and, and, and in, different, in, in different ways so you've been able to use uh, COVID in, in many cases as a, as a positive because it's maybe brought you closer, closer to the Lord in your quiet times uh, and also being able to do things for others, which is great. So that, 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 that's good. Uh, and listen, I, I agree with you. You've, 
there's no better ally or no better friend to have than the Lord Jesus alongside you in difficult times. Uh, and, and that's for sure. And that's, that's obviously been your experience as well, Liam. So I'm, I'm very thankful that you've you've taken the time. I, I know uh, this is not your cup of tea, uh, but I really do appreciate you coming on and, and telling us a little bit uh, about you as opposed to, to William. Uh, and thank you for that. And I just pray and trust that uh, your short story will, will help someone who's who's listening tonight or this afternoon. So thank you, Ilian. Uh, we're we're going to move on now to John is now going to uh, share his message. So thank you, Ilian. Thank you so much again uh, for tuning in. Uh, we've been looking in these three nights at the resurrection of Jesus. And not just the fact of the resurrection of Jesus, but what it actually means for us that Jesus is raised from the dead. And tonight we're going to see that the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection means for us that we can actually have a new start. This is what Paul said elsewhere. He said that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. He also says this, if anyone be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Becoming a Christian means a new start. That's his point, a new creation. And even Jesus says to Nicodemus, he talks to him about a new birth, a new start. So it's all over Christianity. Now I personally know the reality of this. And I want you to know that no matter how low you think you're at, you can have a new start because God has given me one. There are so many people in this world that have come to faith in Jesus and their lives have been totally transformed. Like the man who was asked one time, do you really believe that Jesus turned water into wine? And he replied this, he said, well, I know in my life that he turned whiskey bottles, debt, lies and failure into a family, a house, furniture and actually living. It's a real thing and we can have a new start. The New Testament teaches it and it's a reality around us. Now in Mark's gospel in the last section, he tells us about Jesus' death. But in doing so, he emphasizes three things. Betrayal, false trials, and brutality. And we're going to think about one of those trials tonight. And it involves a story of a man called Barabbas. And he's a brilliant example to us of a new start. And the story revolves around a kind of a strange custom that the Romans had for keeping the people happy. That they would release a prisoner every year at the feast of Passover. Now Jesus at this point had been betrayed in the garden by Judas and then taken before the Jewish council and all night he had been falsely accused, he had been questioned, he had been mocked, beaten, spat upon and they found him guilty even though there wasn't any shred of evidence at all for it. And so now they take him to a second trial before the Roman governor, Pilate, where, where Pilate questioned Jesus. And now Pilate, when he questions Jesus, is amazed by him and actually wants to release him. But politics is a thorny thing. And so he sees his chance. And when the crowd suggests this custom, he offers to release Jesus. But they reply, Barabbas. And so here you have these two men brought out side by side. Barabbas, and his actual name means son of the father. And Jesus, who is God's son, he is the son of the father. And you can kind of see what Mark is doing here in this trial. He wants us to compare these two men. And so let's do that tonight. Barabbas, son of the father. Let's firstly look at his life. Now we're told about this man that he was actually part of the rebellion. Part of an insurrection that had occurred at this time. Now Israel at that state was a state occupied by the Roman rule and so Barabbas was one of the freedom fighters of the day. Zealots they were called because of their passion to win independence for their nation. And so in the name of his cause, Barabbas had actually murdered someone. Now can I just say on a side that if your cause leads you to murder someone, it's not a righteous cause. Anyway, Barabbas is caught and he's imprisoned. But then let's think about not just his life, but about his punishment. He was on death row, waiting to die. He knew that he had done wrong, and he deserved death. And so he had death in the future, but he also 
for the present actually was bound in the act of the past. What I mean it was that not only was he deserving of death, but in the interim, he was enslaved by his act. Now, a horrendous situation for him that he got himself into. But the point that I want to make in that is that we're no different from him. We've all messed up on some level. Now, few of us will have gotten near Barabbas's level, but it must be said that we do live in a land that has been broken by this kind of freedom fighting on both sides. We are a land of the troubles. And I could be talking to someone tonight, like Barabbas, who's got involved on one side or the other and has committed atrocities in the name of your cause. And tonight, you are imprisoned now by guilt. You know that you have done wrong and the guilt is eating you. You know that you have done wrong and you know that you will face punishment. You know that you will have to answer for it and you are scared of that. For you who are listening, I want you to know that you can have a new start. Like this is good news. Barabbas got a new start. But if we want a new start, this is where we need to start. Admitting that we've done wrong. We all know that in the first, the first step in overcoming addiction is to admit that you're an addict. Well, the first step in having a new life, having a new start, is admitting that we need one. Like, do you see this tonight? Do you see that you have done wrong tonight? Again, maybe not to Barabbas's level or standard, but we have done wrong, haven't we? And the Bible says this, and I don't need to press it, but the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And whether we're a big sinner or whether we're a small sinner, we're all sinners. And like, it matters. Like, it matters because God cannot sweep our crimes under the cosmic carpet. He won't, his character won't let him. He's just and he must see that wrongs are righted and he will do on that great day of judgment. Like, can you see tonight that no matter who we are, great sinners, little sinners, we need a new start. <laughs> Let's look at the second son of the father quickly. Jesus Christ, the son of the father. Let's think about his life. He was completely different to Barabbas. In fact, different to anyone everywhere, anywhere that has ever lived. Uh, Pilate actually says, what evil has he done? He shouts to the crowd. And of course, they couldn't point to anything. His enemies couldn't point to anything that he had done wrong. They just shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Now, it is worth thinking about this, that Jesus had never done anything wrong. Like, who is he that has never done anything wrong? So whenever you read the accounts of his life in the Gospels, he always helped people. He healed sickness. He cast out demons. He freed people and brought them to know God. He had encouraged people who were depressed. He had lifted up people that were beaten down in society. He had encouraged huge numbers of people to live a more moral life. And he himself was completely moral in all of his life. <laughs> who is he? That's my point. Who is he? And it's just sad what the people do. That they don't take that on board and they shout out, crucify him, crucify him. And whenever a government gives people what they want, they will always crucify Jesus. Let's think about that punishment. Crucify him, crucify him, they, they shout out. And Mark tells us a little of the brutality of what that meant. And it was cruel. You know, Jesus was scourged. This was unbelievably appalling. The man was tied to a pillar or a post or hands above his head. And the soldier had a whip that split into three. Beaten into it were bits of bone and metal. And the soldier drew back and lashed the whip and pulled it and lashed the whip and pulled it until the man's back literally hung in bleeding shreds. It was truly horrific. The soldiers mocked him. One of the soldiers went out and got a, a thorn bush and, and wound it into a crown and smashed it on his head and beat it in with a reed. They gave him a purple robe and put that reed in his hand and they bowed down to him and mocked him. They punched him. They spat upon him. They made him carry his cross on his already scourged back and shoulders. They brought him out to Calvary and they crucified him. They laid him down on that cross and spiked his hands and his feet to it 
and they lifted up the cross until Jesus was suspended, held to the cross by the nails, and there the man will struggle to breathe. He will suffer from dehydration. And usually the men were crucified naked. Think of the shame. Like, look at the brutality of that. The man was treated worse than an animal. Josephus, that Jewish historian, said it was the most wretched, it was the most wretched of death. The Romans said it was the supreme penalty. And although the Romans adopted it, it was actually so horrendous that they wouldn't acknowledge that they invented such a horror. Tom Holland, the historian, says that the Romans thought it was repellent. It was seen that not even a God could help him. That the man was crucified, that a God wouldn't look upon him because it was so scandalous, obscene and grotesque. Now get a hold tonight of what Jesus went through. And more than that, three hours into that torture, the earth went dark. And God within himself done the unthinkable. And Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus was suffering. But his sufferings were not just physical, they were spiritual as he suffered for our sin. And Paul says in those moments that he, that God, made, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Like, notice that, that God made Jesus sin for us. That Jesus took our place, he died for us, he took our punishment. And so when the story Barabbas goes free, and Jesus is put to death. Like, what a mighty thing that Jesus has done. He took Barabbas' place. He bore his crimes, his murder, his insurrection, his hatred. Jesus was cosmically punished in our place. But not just for Barabbas, but for you and I. The crimes that we have committed against God, the times that we have hated, lusted, or envied, Jesus bore that all. Like, can you see tonight how much God loves you? Jesus took your place. And Jesus died for the innocent. He died, excuse me, the innocent for the guilty. He was crowned with thorns so you could be crowned with glory. He went into the greatest darkness so we could be brought into light. He was punished so we could be forgiven. He died that we can have life and a new start. You know, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a new town. And he rose again three days later. And so that new life that Jesus has can be ours as well. You can have a new start. And here's how though. I want to bring three things to you as we close this weekend out. Firstly, you've got to admit your sin. And I think this can be the hardest thing. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. We don't like to think of ourselves, we, sorry, we like to think of ourselves as right and righteous. But we actually deeply know that we are flawed and broken. Whether we are great sinners like Barabbas or little sinners like the religious folk, we're all sinners. We need to see this. Or we will not think that we need a new start. We do, though, because the Bible says that all have sinned. We need to admit our sin. Secondly, we need to repent of it. We need to see, we need to see what sin is. God hates it and it offends him. I mean, the word repentance means to change our mind. And it's more than being sorry. Judas, for example, after he betrayed the Lord, it said about him that he repented himself. He was sorry. But he didn't go and make it right. He could have, of course, went out to the Lord at Calvary and sought forgiveness like the dying thief, but he didn't. So Judas was remorseful, but not repentant. And this is what I mean. Imagine an older man that starts to feel unwell and he goes to the doctor. And after a thorough examination, the doctor tells him the cause of his illness is excessive smoking. The man says, okay, I feel really bad. I feel sorry that I've smoked in my life. And I'm, I'm going to give them up, you know. Like the man is sorry that he smoked and, and he will give up the cigarettes. But that, will that save him? No, because his lungs and his heart are utterly wrecked. The only thing that could save the man is that he, if he allows the surgeon to perform a heart and lung transplant on him. The question is, will he allow the surgeon to do that? Will he allow the doctor to tell him that he is utterly wrecked? and that he needs a new heart. Suppose if the man said, oh, you know what, I'm, 
I get what you're saying, doctor, but I'm not that bad, you know? I don't need this drastic new thing. I'm not as bad as you said. Sure, like I've smoked and I haven't treated my body as, as well as I should have, but I'm not as bad as you're saying. Well, what happened then? He dies. So many people are like that when it comes to Christianity. But if he says, I am as bad as you're saying, if he agrees with the doctor about how bad he is and allows the doctor to give him a new heart, he will live. And this is what repentance is. It is agreeing with God on how bad we are and that we need deep forgiveness. Listen, we need to repent. We need to agree with God. Admit our sin, repent of our sin. Thirdly, then trust in Jesus. We cannot save ourselves. It's not our goodness, our holiness, our religiousness. Nothing like that can save us. I remember one man saying, if you want forgiveness, get religion. I will tell you now, if you want forgiveness, do not get religion. The word religion means duty, something that you do in order to get. It's a nonsense on many levels. Barabbas, the text says, was released. He was released. He was released. Constantly it says that. The word means he was set free. And it actually means let it go or forgiveness. He was forgiven, forgiven. And that's what forgiveness is. It's being let go, being freed from the punishment of death. Let go from his prison of guilt. How? Was it because his son he did? No. It was Christ's sheer gift for him that he took his place. <laughs> like you can know being let go right now by trusting Jesus and asking him to save you, to forgive you and to give you a new start. And by trusting his work at Calvary, you can know forgiveness. Paul said that if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is trusting in Christ, they are right now a new creation. Made new, born new, they have a new start. Do you want this newness of life? Do you want this new record? Do you want this new start, a new power within? Admit your sin. Repent of that sin and trust in Jesus tonight and you can know newness of life, that new start in him. And we pray that you will. Father, thank you so much for uh, your word to us tonight. And thank you, Lord, that no matter who we are, that, Lord, you offer us a new start. I pray that many that hear this, Lord, will take you up on the offer, will see what Jesus has done. will see how bad we actually are, Lord, and they will trust you. They will repent of their sin and they will trust you and know this new life. Lord, I just pray that um, tonight. Thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. Thank you that you love us so much. And just really pray that you may bless everyone who is watching this in Jesus' name. Okay.